Welcome to today's Politics and Tactics. Today, we're going to go a little light on the politics as PJ and I are actively working, building and researching a couple significant issues that are affecting the fire service. One is going on is a possible alleged pay to play scheme at the IFF and a wrongful termination federal suit that we'll be talking about coming up on a upcoming show. And we're also going to explore what's happening in the Seattle Fire Department. A judge just offered a stern rebuke to city leaders, including the fire chief, for deleting public records. Chief officers are being trolled into becoming the language police and an updated on terminated employees facing gamesmanship and gimmicks, preventing them from returning to work even after the mandates were lifted. A lesson to all chiefs. The cover-up is usually worse than the act, and officers should view all communications conducted in their official capacity as public records, and they should be preserved. As always, on Politics and Tactics, we invite the chief of the Seattle Fire Department and the union president for the Seattle Fire Department to come on, along with the president of the International Association of Firefighters. This is the place for a respectful, cogent debate. Today, we're going to take a step back from the politics, and we have a few inspirational guests to cover the nuances and complexities of mentoring, training, and what they'll be teaching at FDIC. It's I'm going to have PJ introduce our guests, but I'm going to just say one thing about Chief Rubin. Dennis Rubin's on the call today, and when New Haven had a line of duty death, one of the first individuals I called was Chief Rubin. And he enlightened me about a program, and I credit that program for having a tremendous impact on firefighters' health and safety, but also training and how to move forward after a line of duty death. And we're going to explore that as well, because PJ Norwood also participated in that training. PJ, can you introduce our esteemed guests? Yeah, thanks, Frank. Uh, Frank, thanks. I appreciate it. We'll start with uh, with Chief Rubin, just because you're discussing him. We'll give a little bio on him, which I, we could probably spend the whole call just talking about, about his experience. And he's already shaking his head no, because he's one of the most humble guys that, that we know. A man and, that can't keep a job, that's all you got to say. <laughs> you know, and if you don't know Chief Rubin, it won't take long to, to learn about him and his vast experience. Uh, spans more than 35 years. He served as a line firefighter, EMT, company officer, staff officer, command officer. And what I think is the most impressive or most unlucky out of that, he's actually been a fire chief in both Atlanta, Georgia, and Washington, D.C. So when you think of Washington, D.C., you think of all the, the national monuments and the White House, and you think of the protection that goes into that, we usually think of the security side. Not many except us probably think of the fire protection side. Well, Chief Rubin uh, was the chief of that department and got to experience that. He's a uh, currently he's a part-time faculty member for the National Fire Academy. He's an FDIC instructor. He's an amazing author of many leadership books uh, that, that are published uh, that you can get all over the internet. But I would start pointing you towards fire engineering books and videos, of course, first, since that's uh, whose uh, show we're, we're doing today. Uh, he's a great friend of both Frank and I, and he's been a mentor to me uh, for many years. So Chief Rubin, we appreciate you uh, you being here. And before we uh, we get to our next guest, I just want to pick, uh, piggyback on what Frank was saying regarding your program in the New Haven line of duty death. And um, I know Frank is speaking of the, the firefighter Solomon line of duty death when Chief Rubin was uh, the chief of Atlanta Fire in 2006. And I remember seeing the footage of that, the news footage, um, where Chief Rubin uh, made sure that every Atlanta firefighter walked through the scene and got an opportunity to see the scene firsthand uh, to quell a lot of the, the kitchen table rumors in the firehouse. So every firefighter can actually see the layout of the building, what happened and why, and start putting those pieces together. Uh, following the line of duty death in New Haven, I had an unfortunate but fortunate task of coordinating all the peer support. Uh, Chief Alston, Assistant Chief McCarthy headed up that project there. They brought every firefighter in the city through that building for a lot of the same reasons that, that Chief Rubin did, learned it from, from him. And being able to be a non-member of that department, but to take place in those walkthroughs 
and to see the healing that it was providing from the peer support side and the understanding of the incident well, it was paramount. And any chief that's out there listening, any firefighter that's out there listening, if you are uh, ever here of a line of duty death or unfortunately happens in your department, please make sure that the uh, those that are making the decisions consider that. Reach out to Chief Rubin, uh, Chief Ritchie, uh, Chief Alston from the city of New Haven. I'm sure there's hundreds of other departments that have done it. Because uh, being able to sit back and watch firsthand the, the the healing process for the members during that trying time was uh, was was amazing to see that transformation. So, Chief Rubin, thanks for attending, and we'll get back to you. Just to everybody, so don't lose track. Just going top to left here in no order. We have our friend Dave McGlynn. He's not landing aircraft today. He had a headset problem, so he put those on uh, to so we can make sure he could hear us and we could hear him well. Uh, Dave's been, he has over 22 years experience with farmer services. He served both municipal and federal departments. He currently the operations chief and training officer in Pennsylvania. Uh, one, uh, one of the many unique things, but very good things I like about Dave. He's, uh, he served as the training chief for the West Point, New York fire department, the U.S. military academy, uh, which is extremely impressive and extremely unique. And I'm sure you can tell us how few people have actually held that position, uh, past. So he brings a very unique skill set uh, to this conversation today. He's an FDIC instructor, podcast host. He's working on completing or has just recently completed a book that will be published through Fire Engineering Books and Videos that I know everybody that's listening to this is going to be uh, quite excited uh, to see. Moving over in the pyramid of squares here, we have Mike DiStefano. Mike DiStefano has worked in the fire service for just under 20 years. He's worked his way through the ranks Assistant Chief of Professional Development for Brevard County uh, Fire Rescue in Florida. He's a straight uh He's the head strength coach for the Recruit Strength, and he's also a fire engineering author. Uh, the last person I'm not going to introduce, but I just want to say this about it, is Frank. Um, I'd like to congratulate Frank. He recently completed his first book through Fire Engineering Books and Videos on Leadership, and that book will be available at FDIC this year. I know Frank won't tell you about it, so I just want to make sure that I told you, because I've had the, the privilege to take a sneak peek at a couple of the chapters, the cover, the back cover. And uh, as we would all expect, he's done an amazing job. So uh, please, when you get to FDIC, uh, check check that out. Uh, so let's start off with Chief Rubin. Chief, thanks again for coming today. What an honor and pleasure it is here to be here. Needless to say, I think this is one of the best formats uh, in the entire process that fire engineering offers. I know you guys have worked hard a couple of times in the late evening. I, I think the first time I appeared on your guys' show, and it was a lot of fun, a lot of good discussion. Uh, a lot of great information was shared. PJ's muted. I don't Thanks, know if you mentioned it to me for a particular reason or just to say hello. Nope, just to say hello, we'll go to Mike and then we'll go to Dave and then we'll let uh, we'll start the actual conversation today. Uh, good afternoon, guys. Uh, thank you all for having me on here. Definitely excited to be uh, talking with y'all. Uh, my uh, resume is not nearly as impressive as y'all, so I'm uh, I'm excited to hear what y'all have to say. Well, thanks for joining us, Dave. Uh, yeah, hey, thanks uh, for having me on too. <laughs> so I'm not landing a plane. Uh, I uh, I I got earbuds, uh, and my wife uh, dropped them, gave them to me this morning, so I would be able to do the show. And uh, I was having some issues with them. So I actually owe her an apology because uh, I was yelling at her to find them for me this morning on the way out the door. Uh, but I'm at work, so hopefully uh, no calls and uh, I'll be here to to be part of the show. I'm excited to be part of it. I appreciate you guys inviting me. Thanks, Michael. We got you on the show because we needed a chief from somebody from the free state of Florida. I mean, we got the past <laughs> chief of Atlanta in D.C. We needed to bring the free state of Florida on here. Let's start with Chief Rubin. Um, and just kind of go through that program. Cause like I said, you know, I, I was already at fire engineering. I was already a chief and I didn't know about it. I simply called you because I knew that you've had the experience of going through a horrific line of duty death as a chief. And I was like, well, who could I reach out to, to give me some guidance and input on how I can advise chief Alston and chief McCarthy and I apparently picked the right guy because you were telling me stuff that I never heard before. And I was unaware of the program. I was almost embarrassed by it, but I was like, this is just great information. And having you on today, I really wanted our listeners 
to, to know about it because this is something that should be known because everybody that went through there from peer support individuals like PJ to individual firefighters who reached out afterwards were like, it made a difference. It kind of cut down rumor mill. It made a mental health difference. It also made a, a training and a tactical difference to kind of get a global picture of what happened instead of, as we know, with every fire, there's 50 different stories for the same fire. So to be able to put it all together was really the path forward. So chief, if you could kind of explain that and then we'll get started from there. Absolutely. Um, uh, th thank you so much, Frank. With that said though, let me start off by saying I stole the concept and idea from Chief Brunacini. I don't think that's a surprise. When Southwest Grocery burned and firefighter Tolver was killed, um, it really had an impact on the chief being a 30 year friend of his at the time that I'd never seen anything have such an impact. And I know that that lightened his burden, but he also described the fact that it changed the mood and tempo within their department. Uh, the day that Stephen was injured, it was Thanksgiving in 2006, Thanksgiving evening. I was out of town to having dinner with my family. Um, it was about a three hour ride. I had a small Corvette or I guess a regular size Corvette, but I got home in about two hours, if you get what I'm trying to tell you. When I got there, the news was, was really terrible. I'd gone up to the second floor at Grady Hospital. The doc took me aside and to sort of summarize, he said, Chief, you got two things to do here. And I said, what's that Dr. Ingram? He said, first, you're gonna be the cheerleader. Get this family pumped up, tell them to pray, tell them to focus, tell them to really, really have the spirit that, that he's gonna make it and then start preparing for him to die. He said, I've never seen a windpipe so destroyed as this young man and how he's alive right now, I don't know. It took six days for him to pass away. What I've done anytime a firefighter has been in the hospital and I've had on all five trumpets is I take the watch from about midnight to about five or six until it's time to go home, shower and get ready for work. I feel very strongly that when a firefighter can't speak for himself, the, the chief or somebody of rank and the union members, I'm not cutting anybody out at all, but physically needs to be in the hospital close. So it was a really interesting experience because it gets very quiet, even in a burn unit at that period of time. And there's a lot going on up here. And I, I thought about what Chief Brunacini had shared. I thought about the issues that were starting to develop, the rumors. Um, for whatever reason, the firefighter did two things that were taught never, ever, ever to do. I, I, I love the man. I pray for him. I know he's in heaven. I know he's looking over. And I think he would want everyone to hear this is that first he took his face piece off inexplicably. Secondly, he stood up. Well, from that, even though he was a six-year member, even though he had many certifications and training, I, I couldn't afford to live through another one of those. It was, it was disastrous. Stephen had four children, uh, uh, I, beautiful wife. I can go on as long as you want me to about that. And, and you know, he never regained consciousness. I never had a chance to apologize or say sorry or to pray or cry or anything with him uh, and me together. So, so again, that weighed pretty heavy. And as the rumors continue to swirl, the lights came on, so to speak, and I realized that I needed to do exactly what the chief had described. So I got the two very best captains, had them assigned from training to me, and they first worked a couple of days to put together a presentation. The actual radio traffic to me was critical. How we operated was really important. Other than the fact that a member stood up and took off his face piece, it was a pretty easy, easy call. It was an abandoned, vacant, derelict building of 20, 25 years that had just corroded and crumbled. It was in the Ivy City area of, of Atlanta, which is one of the poorest areas. And what I asked him to do was to figure out a way to do the presentation, the structured information on the side of the building, and then walk in the very the exact steps that Stephen walked in. The One of the presenters was the captain of the heavy rescue. He had uh, found him with a thermal imager, so he brought his part of the discussion to bear. Uh, several times, the battalion chief on his shift uh, would show up, who was stellar, did an incredible job, and I could go on. And before you knew it, the rumors dropped off to almost none. The understanding of what happened, and for my, for my two cents, the ability to not repeat such a critical mistake that that was really locked and loaded in on every single operational member of the department. The other thing I did, even prior to him passing away and knowing that was going to happen, I brought in the state fire training director, David Wall. You probably know him, PJ, now that you're in the seat of 
a similar position or close. And David Wall headed up what I called the internal investigation. I asked him, two other, maybe three other local chiefs. I brought a pastor on board uh, and a couple of concerned citizens, and they started the process. Let me say publicly that the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health uh, is incredible. They do the best work possible. I cannot tell you how much uh, Murray Lofton, uh, the value of him to our entire business, he's incredible. Now, the downside is it's going to take him about a year to come visit. Uh, information has a, uh, a time limit. It's going to be perishable, as in terms of memories. So what David Wall did was to put together what I'm going to call an outstanding report that preceded NIOSH by about nine months. And between that training package and the local report, and finally the NIOSH report, we navigated through it without a whole lot of consternation, without a whole lot of mental struggle, without a whole lot of finger pointing and blaming. Uh, unfortunately, I've experienced as the fire chief a total of three line of duty deaths, and uh, the other two were heart attack related. But again, there was finger pointing there. It wasn't much else to say besides diet, exercise, and lifestyle. But it, it does change the complexion of the department. It does change the thought process. It does affect the brotherhood. And I think if you address it face on, head on, it begins to resolve it. One of the parts about that that I'm most proud of is David Rhodes, our very own editor-in-chief, David Rhodes, runs a program in Georgia called Smoke Divers. Today, if you were to go to the Smoke Diver program, that same two-hour package, of course, it's diagrams instead of the physical building that's since been knocked down. But what uh, firefighter uh, Stephen Michael Solomon went through uh, back in November of 2006 still is saving firefighters' lives today. I think I can say that with great certainty. I think David Rhodes as the uh, director of the, the Smoke Divers program for an entire state would agree with me. So he didn't die in vain. I, I don't know how else to say that, but that's important to me as well. So that's kind of the, the genesis of, of my part of that process. Uh, I've had one other experience where a firefighter was burned 35 to 37% third degree. Michael LaCour, he was a sergeant in Washington, D.C., and we did the exact same thing. The initial reaction to that, because Michael was not going to pass away. I knew he was going to be in the hospital for a while, but was just how dare and how disrespectful. And, you know, after about the third or fourth, maybe the fourth session, because there's four platoons, it turned out to be as good as ice cream, if you get my point. But getting over that hump, recognizing that this is a little different, may feel a little unusual, but I couldn't have anybody else suffer like Michael did or die such as Stephen did. Very, very well said and a lot of great information there. And I want to go to Michael and we want to talk about, well, I never heard of the importance of bringing everybody from the department through for that line of duty death. One thing when I was coming up in the fire service, living in a firehouse in Montgomery County, Maryland, now John Kay, who's a sergeant in the Detroit Fire uh, Department, after every single fire, if the lieutenant didn't, after they had their after action review, John Kay would take all the livings together and say, all right, let's walk through and show you what everybody did, why they did it, take us up on the roof, take us through. And it was something that I brought to New Haven where, hey, it's great to have the company officers critique, but somebody's got to take the firefighters, especially those one or two new firefighters that are on your ship, through the building and kind of make it a habit. And sometimes the officer gets caught up in stuff. This is a great opportunity to mentor that senior firefighter that you trust to, hey, take these two individuals through and walk them through. Uh, Mike DiStefano, you're uh, Chief of Professional Development. Do you guys have anything like that in Florida that you do as a practice? As far as mentoring goes, you're talking about? Yes. So yeah, we have, a, we have like an informal mentorship program that we utilize, which is, you know, basically we have a list of people that are out there that are willing and accepted to be mentors. That way they know any of the new guys or anything, know that they can go to them and they can talk to them. They can learn from them. But I think really the, the challenge that we face is when you start a formal mentorship is people kind of get forced into it. And when they're forced into it, it's, it's that less organic approach to it. You want the people to kind of select someone that they personally have some sort of investment with, whether it's this, like you said, the senior guy that's on your crew, or maybe it's somebody that they went to fire school with or whatever it may be. And, uh, and be able to connect with them that way. 
to guide them through the process of, of becoming a firefighter. Um, like he was mentioned as well with the lieutenant and having your senior firefighter there, uh, a lot of times with our, our mentoring approach, we kind of look to that senior firefighter to kind of take over that role of playing dad in the, in the fire station and allowing the lieutenant to kind of step back and uh, guide him or her so that they're able to promote in the process and continue on that way as well. That's great. I'm going to go to Dave McGlenn and then I'll go back to Chief Rubin on the same subject. Um, Mike brought up some great point about, you know, making sure that the person wants to be mentored or the, the mentor wants to mentor. But all of our officers should be mentors. And, and one thing that uh, a battalion chief from Wallingford, Connecticut taught me that I thought was really good that I think a lot of company officers get wrong is we always want to tend to mentor the very best. And that may be the case if you're not the company officer, that you want to find that person that you see as the next rising, shining star to mentor. But if you're the company officer, your job is to really mentor the individual in the margins, to try to find out what motivates that individual to get that person up. And by doing practical mentoring like this walkthroughs at a fire is a great way to start building that relationship. Dave, can you weigh in on that? And then we'll go to Keith Rubin. Yeah, no, I, I would totally agree with that. So uh, to the first point that you made about uh, officers or chief officers that uh, oftentimes you'll find them, they'll mentor uh, the the stellar guys, right? The standout uh, hot shots. And it's because there's no challenge in that. Uh, it's the same with misery, right? You know, we, we, we say, oh, you know, why, why is there, why are people co-misery? Well, because there's, there's no effort in being miserable. You know, all I have to do is just pretend to be in a bad mood today and six other guys are going to find a reason to do it too. Um, yeah, the challenge is definitely in finding the guy that, uh, needs the mentoring and not to discard it or discredit it and say that nobody does, but, uh, or not everybody does, but some more than others. And as a company officer, uh, it's a, it's a testament to your ability to be a leader. Plus that's going to strengthen your ability, uh, build character and taking on more challenging tasks when you can tap into the most challenging guy in your organization. If you can mentor that person, you get a positive outcome from it. That person, you develop that mutual trust over time. Uh, you know, the I think the biggest win for that is that guy gets promoted one day for for good cause. You know, for good reason. So yeah, it uh, it's very important. And and you are one hundred percent right that uh, oftentimes a lot of guys will uh, claim to be mentors to the easy guy. Like I'm not gonna go and I can't mentor a guy that's better than me. How am I mentoring him? He's already better than me. And uh, uh, Mike, what you were saying before, I, I like that you guys have, even if it's unofficial, I like that you guys have a program for that. You know, a lot of times people heard, you know, uh, some book or something say that they need to have a, uh, a mentorship program in their fire department or in their organization. It being unofficial is actually better. That makes it last and makes it gain the luster that it needs. When it's official, now it's a requirement. Now we're forcing people to do it. And like you said before, then they're, they're, they're not as receptive to it, you know, so it, it almost fails in nature. So it's being unofficial. I would, my suggestion would be to, to keep it that way. You know what I'm saying? Chief Rubin, I'm going to go with you to hot wash and then we'll go to PJ. One thing that I've always found very effective as a company officer and as a chief for the hot wash is start off by what you would have done different in hindsight or something that you thought that you did wrong or you could have done better. And whenever I've taken responsibility for my own actions or inactions, it really spurs conversation and it lets everybody know that, okay, it's okay. You can fail without being a failure as long as we're always working to do better. And that alone is informal mentoring. Uh, Chief Rubin, weigh in. Oh, yes, sir. I, I just thought I'd add a little something to this discussion <clears throat> in that uh, disclosure first. I, I did my private time in Washington, D.C. at a really busy company. So when you talk about who I'm most connected to, it's going to be D.C. Uh, with that said, the assistant chief, who probably you guys may know, Larry Schultz proposed a program to me. And when I say proposed, if you know Chief Schultz, we were going to do it anyway. And I, and I love the concept. And he said, well, we're going to start doing it every working fire dispatch, which is maybe three or four a week. Um, is we're going to do a program that I want to call No One Goes Home. So I want that to sink in for a second. No one goes home. Not everyone goes home. Now, I hope Chief Sarnicky is not watching because his blood pressure just went up. No disrespect. The 16 are, are incredible. We've got to do those. He's amazing. 
Chief Zarnicki, thank you. Thank you for your incredible service. What Schultze developed was a program after the fire is knocked down and we, we've gone under control and it's time to start thinking about demobilization, sending folks home, figuring out about a shower and a hot cup of coffee. Before that occurred, all the officers would gather at the command post. Now, as many of the work and fire dispatches that I could go on, I went. I don't know that he would miss many unless he was on vacation or away. So one of the two of us were there. I, I Except for driving there, I wouldn't have made any mistakes because the battalion or the deputy ran the fire and did an incredible job. And again, I'm blessed. And I, I think Schultz would handle it the same way. But the battalion would start off with the first in engine. What were your actions? How did you do that? We had a standard first in engine lays a supply line to the front, gets out of the way of the ladder truck, advances an inch and a half. And I did say an inch and a half to the front door. If there's fire, they take that line to where the fire is burning, search along the way. And I could go into all of our details, but you get the idea. And if they varied from that, that's okay. But why? What was the variation? Did you see somebody in the window? Was there a lady screaming that there was a baby on the second floor and you knew you could get there quicker on the fire escape or whatever? Has everyone got a chance to do that? I think it did a couple of things. The really good folks got the brag, let's be honest. And, and I think uh, Chief McGlynn was, was right on track with that. Really easy to manage the great people. And Dave, I, I think you knocked it out of the park. The other folks got the message you know, damn, this boss is going to hold us accountable above the battalion level. And of course, the battalion, they're worried about making deputy, make a lot of money as a deputy in Washington. So it was really good all the way around. The only person that drew the very short straw, the safety officer, he or she had to get all this information gathered, put it into a, a, a prepared form that Chief Schultz had provided. That prepared form then became the opportunity for, uh, let's say I was on, on number one platoon, two, three, and four could look at those. Two, three, and four platoons were expected to. And it really was a very positive experience as well. And, you know, at times, some of the battalion chiefs or the deputy, whoever was running the show, would kind of get into it and they'd say, okay, now as we do this, we're going to walk to side B, uh, you know, et cetera. And, and take a look at exactly what we're up against. I've never seen a fire department connection on side C. I'm, I'm making that up, side Charlie. Uh, that may not be the case at all, but I'm just saying. And we would take a look at that and we'd talk about it. And this Knox box, man, it was in a crazy location. Let me show you where, and it was really a powerful tool. And it's something that I would urge anybody to do. If uh, Mayor Finty would have only gotten reelected, Frank. <laughs> Politics at its best. You know, it uh, is what it is. PJ, weigh in. Yeah, I want to go back to something that Dave was saying, and I, I like to hear that it, the difference between a formal and informal mentor program. I thought that was pretty key, something I've never considered before. The other thing he said is that, you know, some people feel that they can't mentor somebody because they're of a, a lower rank or they don't view themselves on the same level. And I just, uh, you know, and not even an hour ago, I had one of my instructors. He's a lieutenant in a department here in Connecticut. He's one of my uh, part-time, but, you know, very active instructors who brought to me a program. So I had him come in. We're discussing it a little bit further. I was being mentored by him from our conversation. I was learning things from him in a perspective that I've never considered. So don't feel you need to be, if you're a chief, you can't be mentored by a backseat firefighter because that backseat firefighter may have experiences, personal or professional, that can teach you something. So none of us are above being mentored by anybody. I mean, I learned stuff from my daughter. My daughter's 20 years old. She mentors me in a lot of things, uh, you know, that I'm not familiar with that I don't understand. So mentors come in all sizes, shapes, ages, experiences. And I think if we don't limit ourselves, almost every conversation we can have with anybody mentors us. Mo some good, some bad, Frank, just like our recent leadership article, right? We can learn something from everybody. Um, hopefully they're positive, but we, as we know, we learn a lot of how we uh, we format our day and our plans and our experiences by some of the uh, negative consequences or negative conversations we've had. We say, I don't ever want to do that. I will never say that. Or, hey, I just learned something good and apply it. So Dave, thanks for bringing that up. It was a, a very good point. And one of the things that we see the only thing worse than having no mentor is having one mentor. 
So what happens a lot of times, whether you're a firefighter or a chief, you get comfortable with somebody that you seek advice for. And then all of a sudden you're going to that same well all the time. And then you'll find yourself talking to that person that's where that person's giving you advice that's beyond their experience. You got to be willing to reach out, talk to different people and bring yourself up. Uh, Chief DeStefano, you want to weigh in on that? Absolutely. So one thing that PJ said that I really like is the, uh, the fact that it doesn't really matter what rank you are or anything like that, or even how long you've been on the job. When we're, when we're mentoring someone or when you are being mentored by someone, you're the mentee, it's important to realize that you're, you're kind of being mentored for the, the traits more than necessarily the rank. They can help guide you in your career path, but it's the traits that you're seeking out. And that's going back to that whole informal versus formal. The informal mentorship allows that person to go out there and say, you know, in my home life, this person's a really stellar father and, and uh, you know, family guy. I want to be mentored as far as that aspect of my life by this one. When it comes to leadership, they may look at someone who's a, a chief officer and say, I want to be mentored by that person. Um, and, and, you know, that's that's kind of how we want to look at it is, is what traits and what specific things do we want to pull from each different person, which kind of lines up with what you're talking about as well. And not having one single person that you're looking toward for advice. So funny enough, when we look at the training world, this is kind of similar to that as well. Whenever we train all together and we're constantly training within our department and within you know, our individual crew, we kind of inbreed the training. It becomes where everybody learns the same exact thing. And we're, all we're doing is constantly doing the same thing over and over and over again. But getting out there to like conferences like FDIC, all the various fire conferences that are going on throughout the, the country and learning from people that are outside your organization teaches you all those different ideas that you might be able to utilize and bring back to your department. Same thing with mentoring, talking to these different people, you bring back those ideas that work for you and kind of roll it all into what works best for you to be a better and more successful firefighter. Mike, you said something great there. And, you know, a lot of times when you talked about FDIC, another thing about mentoring and why conferences are so important is you can't mentor somebody or be a good officer or a good firefighter if you're part of the rumor mill. And we, we're human. We all want to be a part of the room. We all want to say the latest gossip. But if you're doing that at work, you're diminishing your own command, where having friends and mentors outside of your department allows you to tell the story, be a gossip, but where the names don't, don't matter. If I'm talking to Dave on the phone, I could say, do you believe what this person did? The name doesn't mean anything to him. He's in Pennsylvania, but you get it out without being part of that rumor mill. Dave, you want to weigh in on that? We'll go around the horn. Yeah. So, uh, one, we've never done that before, <laughs> but, uh, no, but uh, yeah, absolutely. So there are a lot of good points there. So uh, I, I'm just trying to process them all because I'm like sitting here, I'm listening to what PJ said and what Mike said, and which you just said. So uh, yes, to just uh, go off of what you just said, uh, Frank, and then uh, going back into what you said, Mike. Um, so yeah, absolutely. If if you don't, uh, if you're if you're gossiping with your people. Uh, and you're perceived in, let's say, a leadership or in a, in a level of mentorship, right? Uh, you have that capacity. That's the perception that your people have of you, right? Uh, and you're a gossiper uh, in a negative form of gossiping. Then that's the culture that you're mentoring. So, so by definition, uh, mentoring is is a future. It's a long haul thing, right? It's the long term. It's the three to five, right? So we are um, we're what we're doing is, is we're working with our people to try to build them over the course of time. And, and that's a, a continuous thing. It's not just an in the moment. So it can be an in the topic. You don't always want to have the same mentor because not everybody's a subject matter export, which going back into the point, like what you were saying before, Mike, about, you know, uh, training, training with the same crew, go out and network. Um, you know, I talk about that, Frank, you know, I mean, that's all I talk about is that, you know, you gotta go out and network with people. There's a, endless possibilities with networking, talk to people, spark, spark up a conversation, train with these folks, you know, all of us run mutual aid, whether you're in a big city or in a small podunk town, everybody runs mutual aid, right? Chief Ruben, when you were down in DC, you even still had mutual aid coming in, you know? Um, so, you know, you, you, you have to train with these folks. You have to understand their skill set. But also while you're doing that, like, uh, you know, not just saying it because I'm on the show. Like, so like PJ and Frank, these are two guys that I talk to 
for on the regular. Uh, I, I reach out to them for life stuff, not even just firefighting stuff anymore. It's literally like life stuff. Like I'm having a hard time with this. And I talk to these guys and they're like big brothers. And that, that has gone through me being a fanboy and following their material and their content through the years and attending their classes to then getting to know them and networking with them. So now I can pick up the phone and I can talk to these people and they are part of my life in my development as a person, as a, as a steward to the fire service, as a leader. Um, you know, so it, it, there's a lot of endless possibilities with this mentoring thing. And, and, um, and I, I, the one thing I want to just end it with, I hate that it's become a buzzword over the past few years. So it, it's a very important thing. A lot of the things we talk about in the fire service uh, are important. This mentor thing is so important. If you realize it's such an, uh, a, a pop-up thing, right? It becomes sexy. And the reason why is because everybody seeks guidance and everybody wants that kind of assurance from somebody else because in, in nature, we're indecisive. We, we have an idea, but we're not sure if that's the one we should execute, right? We can command the hell out of a fire, but if we, we need to decide if we want to change pens from black to, to blue, we got to talk to six people and make sure that we're making the right decision. So, um, you know, it is very important that we take it serious and not use it as a buzzword to bastardize it either. You know, uh, be cautious of who you consider a mentor. Just because you read somebody's book doesn't mean they're your mentor. You know, they have to care about your development just as much as you care that they care. And it goes back to that mutual trust thing. So that's all. PJ? Yeah, I think those are those are great points. And I, Dave, I think you could look at that. And why, if I agree with what you're saying, I could also turn that around a little bit and say, well, yes, I 100% agree. But there are also a lot of mentors out there who I've looked to for not formal mentors, like we discussed earlier, you know, informal mentors that I'm learning something from on a regular basis through maybe their reading, maybe through their their multimedia, through their YouTube channel, through, you know, phone conversations. You know, I necessarily am that guy that I don't feel that I need to know somebody specifically and have a, a relationship for them to mentor me in certain things, or that maybe it's lack of the use, or I use the word mentor as much broad and somebody that's teaching me something or educating me something, where maybe for me personally, I need to refocus the how I use or, or uh, reflect to the word being a mentor. Because I, I look at, I have hundreds of mentors, you know, people that I look up to, uh, to learn a lot of different things from, from all walks of life, from all ranks, fire service, EMS, and just in, in life general. So I think it's also how we each in look at what a mentor is to us, and then how we use that to go forward. Absolutely. We got a question from Jason Holbelman, who's a great instructor at FDIC, and proof positive that more than my mother watches this show. Um, he posted this on Facebook. And he talked about, you know, our members need to vent and you need to be discreet. And what I always say is this comes down to if you're an officer about projecting a consistent set of standards and values, because one of the biggest traps that officers get into is when somebody comes to you and they want something discreet is that you agree that you're going to keep it to yourself before you know what it is. Your personnel need to know that you are not a priest and you are not a rabbi and that you will do everything to help them. You will offer EAP. You will do everything. There are some things that you cannot unring the bell. If you tell me as a boss, I will have to act on that. Now, th this doesn't mean somebody who's going through a divorce or personal life. You have to be trustworthy 100%. But you can never tell an employee that I'm just going to keep this between me and you because that may not serve their best interests or the interests of your organization. And that's a trap a lot of leaders get into. I'm going to give you a, a real easy example to this before I move to Chief Rubin. Um, I was teaching flashover training and I had a firefighter say to me, he came to me and say, hey, Lou, I got burned on my foot. And I said, OK, we'll go to Ahmed and uh, we'll get you checked out and I'll do the paperwork. And they said, no, no, I'm fine. Well, right then and there, I failed to do my job because they reported an injury, injury to me. I had a responsibility to report it up and do the paperwork. But no, I took the easy way out. And I said, I mean, this guy was Chris Sikowski. I'll say his name. He, he's a big guy. If he fought Bigfoot, he'd probably come out on top. I mean, this is a tough fireman's fireman. So I'm like, ah, he's going to be fine. I get a call home on Sunday. This was Friday. Uh, hey, Lou. Uh, my foot's blown up. It's all infected. I can't feel it. 
I'm like, you got to go to the hospital. And now who's on the hook? So some things you do not have the right to be discreet about, and especially an injury. If you're a training officer, if an injury is reported, it gets documented, it gets treated, it's for the organization's good, it's for your good. Don't make the mistake I made. And same thing when it comes to suicide. We all, Help shouldn't be a four-letter word. It's okay to help each other. But some things are beyond your control. But here's the thing. Make sure your, your regular members won't be a problem. Your friends will be the problem. Make sure your friends know that when they come to you, you have an official, in your official capacity, you have to act. You can't, there's no take the badge off. It doesn't work in this day and age. There's no such thing as that. You know, you got a responsibility to take care of each other. And if it is something that you can keep discreet, keep it discreet. Don't spread the rumor. Talk to somebody else, you know, Chief Rubin, weigh in. Absolutely. I, I would say you in the role as lieutenant or any person of rank in the organization becomes a mandated reporter. So uh, obviously you got to follow through. And that was a, a pretty interesting and compelling case study. When we talk about mentors, uh, again, I know I'm the old guy, so I'm going to go back to the old guy standards. When you say the word mentor to me, that's somebody that seeks me out, that says, hey, Rube, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? I'm studying for captain. Do you have any advice? Uh, uh, whatever it may be, even personal things. I'm getting married. All right, two divorces, maybe they wouldn't ask me about that one. So I think that that's really a little bit of a different relationship, mentor-mentee than trying to do things to work with the team members. Team members meaning maybe there's somebody not doing well. I don't know that that's mentoring as much as it is providing appropriate corrections at whatever level, time, and place. And I, I just don't want to get too confused. I don't remember whether it was Mike or Dave mentioned it, it's almost be, mentors almost become a cliche and it shouldn't because it's very, very powerful. The other thing that I wish I would have done, I'm going to also self-disclose a, a problem that I had, is Atlanta, again, was a very interesting process. And we set up a, a way of training folks to go through the written exam uh, using Atlanta Clark University and the CPAD test. And they could, we, we had enough funding to be able to run that for an extended period of time. The firefighters managed it. They got overtime pay. They loved it. And again, it was bringing people into our business that didn't have uh, previous jobs, uh, for instance, like working in the federal fire department or volunteer fire department or family in the fire department. Where I, where I missed the boat, I wish I would have assigned them a mentor or somebody similar to that. While all this is going on, my oldest child was in the United States Navy, and he went off to Persian Gulf. Uh, I, I, I think it was Persian Gulf 1 and then on to, to, the, to Desert Storm, Persian Gulf 2. And when he got to the ship in San Diego as an 18 or 19-year-old kid out of high school, he had a person for the first couple of weeks that spent every minute with him that was reasonable uh, to make sure that he knew what his job was, how to do his job, when to do his job, what the, what the alarm sounded like for different things. Uh, for goodness sakes, they were getting ready to go to war. So with all that said, I wish, going back to the Atlanta, when we started bringing in people that were really good people and turned out to be great firefighters in most cases, um, I wish I would have assigned them a formal mentor. Um, the other thing that I, I think is worth bringing up is the discussion that always pops up for the chief is about succession planning. Succession planning says, you know, PJ is a really, really cool guy. I really like him. He's amazing. But He's really follically challenged. He, he's, he doesn't have a lot of hair. Frank, you got a lot of hair. So I'm going to pick you to be the champ. I'm going to start uh, providing opportunities for you to train. You're going to learn your details and information so well. The next time they need to promote a fill in the blank, you're going to be the likely candidate. I don't think the chief can do that. I really don't. I, I went to Arizona State University for two semesters, and I just happened to take human resources while I was there. And what was extremely interesting is businesses put together a formal succession chart. Here's the two or three people that can become the president. Here's the two or three people in line, and we're going to invest. And I guess when you're in the private sector, you can do that. In the public sector, what I would ask fire chiefs to do, and this is what I do when I'm at the National Fire Academy teaching, is consider it bench strength. Now, I've got some really robust guys looking at me. 
all of you are involved at one point in time or maybe even currently in sports, yes or no? And if you were the coach of the team or the captain of the team or a person who wants to win on the team, you really can't pick one person. Who do you have to pick? Everyone. Bench strength. So when somebody talks about succession planning, I try to slow them down really quick. And the other part about succession planning, and I know that's a little different. To me, at least, it's a lot different than mentoring. But when I hear about succession planning, I would love to have a research project to complete how many fire chiefs get to pick the next fire chief. It does happen. It's very, very seldom. It does happen. It's usually typically more political. Um, or maybe, just maybe, the fire chief might have a little bit of input. But in many cases, it's the mayor, the city manager, the, the uh, public safety committee, whatever it is, uh, at the highest levels of government committee, that is. So when we say succession planning, I, I kind of scratch my head and would say work on bench strength. When you tell me about mentor, it's usually somebody that, that seeks me out. And, you know, I'd give them the shirt off my back if I could. And I mean that. But I'm not going to go out and say, I'd really like to mentor you or I'd really like to mentor him. I just wouldn't do that. So, again, I get it. I'm an old guy and you two can or the, the two presenters and, the, and, the, and the, the two facilitators can beat me up now. And that's OK. No, I, I think what you're saying is really, really poignant. And the fact of the matter is we need to provide equal opportunity. And to give you kind of an example on that, giving that opportunity to everybody, New York City did a thing when you come out of their recruit class, you go to an engine company for a while, then you go to a busy truck for a while, they shift them around where in most departments today, it's still up to the chief and those individual assignments. And you know, I look to, to young Justin McCarthy, who's now an assistant chief, but Justin was, went to a busy, came on New Haven and trained him in the academy. He went to a busy company, busiest engine in the city. And then they had an opportunity to put in a special operations unit, a squad. He got there, he excelled. And when he got promoted to lieutenant, he had the ability to stay there to be the officer on the squad. And he came to me and I said, that'd be the worst thing you could do for your career. And mm -hmm. he's like, what are you talking about? I go, no one will respect you. I go, you're not arriving first due. I said, go back to the busiest truck, busiest engine, make your bones, give a first couple first due radio reports, do a year, do two years, and then go to the squad as a boss. And you, your credibility will be through the roof. And he took that advice and wow, it's not, good. He, he credits that he wasn't, uh, he was uncomfortable, you know, coming off of where he loved to be, where he wanted to be. So I think New York kind of provided the opportunity for everybody. They didn't let the person decide, but uh, Mike weigh in on that. I don't know what the right answer is or whether it should be mandated or not, but those are two examples of it. Well, I think what the chief was saying about the bench strength is, is right on point is not specifically picking a person to replace but having a candidate pool to replace. So like one of the things that we do at our department is that we have a list of, uh, it's more of a suggested list of like courses to take, classes to take. Okay, you've been here for this amount of years, you should take this class and then you should take this class. And at the end of the day, it matches what the union contract says for what the candidate is eligible to promote to a lieutenant or to a chief or anything like that. That way we're building up a larger pool of people who are interested and able to test. If someone's a high performing candidate and we see a lot of leadership potential in them, we may reach out to them and say, hey, it'd be in your best interest to start taking these classes. Or in our system, we have bid, a bid system where the individual can bid based on seniority. It's, hey, you should bid to those busy stations. You should bid to these places that get more fires, that run more calls, because you're going to grow better as an officer that way by doing all that and creating that entire pool of people that can test and then letting the actual testing process you know, handle it so that there's no uh, favoritism or anything like that. And I think that's key. And Chief Rubin calls it the career ladder plan. And, exactly. you know, that was one of the things that I was proud of that I did with Chief Alston is put together the reading list for every promotion in the city so that if you're a firefighter, you know what the books are for captain, lieutenant and up. We want everybody to have the answers. We want that equal opportunity doesn't equate to equal outcome. We're not talking about the code word for gimmicks and schemes of equal outcome, but we want to make sure that nobody's hand is on the scale, that we provide that career plan ladder, and that we're actually building all of our personnel. Dave McGlenn, weigh in on that. 
Yeah. So uh, a lot of the, uh, again, a lot of good points being covered. So it just, um, yeah, I, I want to agree with uh, everything all of you just said uh, back to uh, uh, chief Rubens part. So I'm like, literally like trying to like take little notes here. Um, which kind of ties back into the whole mentor thing, right? Like, so I'm a guest on the show with a guy and I'm like, hey, hey Ruben's, Ruben's throwing some nuggets out here, man. I got to write this down, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I, I like, I like everything that we're, we're, uh, we're covering. And, and, and then Mike, uh, you know, same thing uh, with, with, uh, with, with what you were saying. I, I'll tell you, uh, I love the FDNY approach thing. So unfortunately for me uh, and where I work now, so it doesn't mean that the federal government doesn't do this. So when I was at West Point, so I'm just going to use that. Uh, we had the thing we used to call the globe and uh, we would shake the globe every two years. And uh, what they would do is to prevent complacency, but also to kind of build on new uh, SMEs uh, and uh, new, you know, uh, strengthen the skill set, make everybody versatile. So if you're not familiar with West Point, uh, as far as the fire department goes, they do it all. I'm not saying that because I worked there. I'm not saying it because the name is is, a, is a, an important name. It's because I worked there and I didn't realize until I got there how much they actually did. Um, and with that, uh, you know, they would shake up, they would take lieutenants that were on the squad company and they'd move them to the truck and they'd take a captain that was uh, on the engine or the rescue and they'd move them to the squad company or whatever. Um, and they would do the station shake up. And uh and a lot of guys, you know, they would they would grumble about it, but it, it actually worked out because in the years that I was there, I was able to see lieutenants that were in all three uh, stations assigned to all four different companies be very versatile in almost everything and have an impact that they didn't didn't just have uh, a reach on two or three people, but they had a reach on four to six people to then 12 people, uh, you know, over a course of four or five years. Um, so it is important. Uh, it, it helps build you as uh, the mentor because uh, back to what PJ said way earlier, rank doesn't matter. So uh, I'm going to throw this one out there. While you're mentoring someone, uh, your mentee is actually a mentor to you indirectly, whether they realize it or not, and whether you realize it or not, because you, if you care, you're going to be on your game and uh, they're going to expect you to be on their game. So you're going to build yourself and being better to not uh, let them down and meet the expectation that they have of you. So, uh, yeah, it's a, a lot of good stuff. Everybody's covering and, and, and Chief Ruben, you know, thank thanks for being on because I'm just like sitting here like taking all these nuggets. But but, yeah, you know, I think that uh, the versatility aspect of it, it you know, it, it prevents the complacency. There's nothing wrong with crew concept. I'm all about this. You know, we, the brotherhood, uh, you know, all that stuff, the cohesion. It's all great stuff. I love it. Um, but just in, in the in the topic that we're talking about, early developmental, it is nice to kind of have that shake up, change the scenery a little bit. It makes you more versatile, makes you stronger, gives you the challenge. Um, yeah, I, I like that. Charles de Gaulle said the cemetery is filled with indispensable men. And you could add that to nowadays in our historical context of women as well. Uh, PJ, weigh in. Yeah, Frank, thanks. As always, it's, it's a great conversation. Dave, I agree with you. Every time I listen to Ruben, I uh, I take some notes because he drops them all the time. So, Frank, I just want to hit a couple of the comments that are uh, that Peter has copied into the chat from us from Facebook. Uh, so, so first, thanks to Jason Holverman, who you already hit. Uh, Nick Salome, uh, avoid gossip. Stick with fact-based information and correct gossip with facts where possible. Uh, Sisters Camp Sherman Fire District, uh, they have two. The first one is when we, as officers, especially chief officers, identify a confidant to vent to, it needs to be someone who has no vested interest or responsibility to report. And the second comment by the same would be, Rube, you're right on with that point. We need to be open to being mentors, but not seek out those to mentor. Um, these are this. That's a dangerous thing. So those are just our comments from Facebook. I wanted to bring uh, into the conversation. I would say that those are our great points and things that we're, we're discussing. And I like Jason Holberman. He said, we all need a mentee who is a trusted and discreet. So he turned, he changed the mentee word to mentee. I thought he was ordering Starbucks. So that's, that's good. <laughs> Not my dyslexia uh, getting in there, but no, Jason's great. Uh, Chief Rubin, you want, you want to weigh in and uh, what do you call it? Go ahead. Uh, well, you know, I'll gladly do that. One of the processes that Washington used that was very effective, um, every station has a single captain 
and three lieutenants. Remember, it's a four platoon system. So the captain always moved forward. So at the uh, beginning of the new year, a captain on number one platoon moved to number two. The next year, he moved to number three. The lieutenant fell back. So captain uh, at engine 10, where I was, would move to number two. Lieutenant would then move from number two back to number one. So if you're a lieutenant, you're going to be in your spot for three years. If you're a captain, you're going to move every year. Now, to me, it was so important because they're getting a, a really broad picture of what's going on, not just in their command and their station, but they're seeing a bitter, bigger, broader picture of the department. Instead of knowing an engine company, for instance, ran on seven guys, instead of knowing seven members pretty well, uh, seven to make four, by the way, if anybody's uh, drooling, but uh, one person would get detailed and leave and all that, uh, they would see 28 people over that cycle and add four more to that if it was a truck company. So the captains would usually begin moving into battalion chief somewhere between five to 10 years. And the lieutenants didn't stay lieutenants uh, too terribly long either. So it was a really strong process. Uh, it it uh, uh, bit the uh, rumor bugs and all those things in the butt. Instead of me disliking number two, if I wait around long enough, I'm going to move to number two platoon. So I probably better help them out as best I can, because pretty soon I'm going to own that platoon as an example. So I, I thought that was some some really, really great discussion that was had. Thank you. One of the other things that we need to correct on the job that's kind of in line with mentoring is we need to stop the mutual jealousy on the job. A lot of times, you know, the people that do a great job, the men and women that are out there every day working hard, doing that stellar job, we ask them to do more. And those that are in the margins, we often ignore. And those are the individuals that you need to mentor. And I just want to hit uh, one thing that Nick said. He said, correct gossip with facts when possible. Uh, when I was union president, when I heard somebody talking about me, you better believe it. Car 81 would be on the apron. I'd sit down at the kitchen table, call everybody around because the truth fears no question and correct the gossip, correct the information with real information right up front. It's a real strong uh, technique. Um, Michael, we're going to be at the witching hour here. Why don't you give us uh, your last words? I'll go completely around the horn and uh, Chief Stefano, go ahead. So I think to, to kind of wrap it up here, one of the big things that uh, that I, I'm seeing is everybody kind of mentioned it, is that there needs to be clear expectations of whatever the relationship is. So if you have that venting person, you need to have that clear expectations that you are there to vent and that you, there's nothing that needs to be done with it. You don't want it to be, you know, not necessarily, I'm not looking for advice. I'm just wanting to vent to somebody. Um, same with the mentorship. If we're creating a mentorship, there needs to be expectations from the mentee toward the mentor and vice versa so that everybody's on the same page with that, whether it's formal or informal. So I think having those expectations and uh, presenting them and everybody agreeing to them is going to be what makes everybody successful in all these relationships we talked about. Absolutely. Dave McGlenn, not only your last words, but why don't you plug your FDIC class? Because your class that I have attended every year at FDIC, I've seen you grow as an instructor. You're a phenomenal consummate professional, and I can't wait to see you teaching this year at FDIC as well. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'll just I'll finish with uh, the topic that we've been talking about. So, uh, you know, a, lo a lot of great stuff. Uh, and I'm not saying that just to say it. I, and people always say that kind of stuff. I, I, I truly mean it. I learned a lot. So um, I think a key takeaway for the for the viewer on this is, uh, you know, we're sitting here on the panel and each of us is learning a new point from one another, uh, which goes to show the testament and the, and the, and the true ability of, of, of mentorship, right? Uh, and, and, and the importance and the value of it. Um, so uh, the takeaway there is, is that, is just um, share information. Uh, like Mike said before, you know, uh, be transparent in the sense that, uh, like our wives say, sometimes I just want you to listen to me same with firemen, you know, sometimes they just want to be heard and uh, we need to kind of put our biases aside and, and, and let them be heard. Um, so, you know, that, that's a, uh, it's, it's tricky. That's a challenge. Uh, but sometimes it's what we would want. And that's where that empathy piece comes in is how would we want somebody to respond to us if we needed to vent or whatever? Uh, that's a, a, a key attribute of a, of a good mentor. Um, and then thank you, Frank. Uh, I'll say, one, thank you uh, to all of you and, and PJ and Frank, you know, thank you for having me on. Uh, I, I, uh, I, 
I mean it. It means a lot, uh, you know. Um, so I'm teaching Wednesday, uh, 3.30. Uh, I don't know what day that is. What is that? 26th. There you go. Had to look back behind me. Hey, you like my calendar, by the way? That's pretty cool, right? I can't see it. Oh, all right. Well, anyway, it's it's an old phone. It says blocking friends in the 90s with the phone off the hook. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so what do you call it? I'm teaching the 26th of April, uh, which is Wednesday at 3.30 in the afternoon. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, I've, I've revamped my program. So, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just finished writing my books. Uh, I'll, I'll let people know when that's going to be coming out. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I've had people contribute to it. So I thank I thank those that did PJ and Frank, you guys are in it. Thank you. Um, so the, the class is about that and the class is called, do you have what it takes to be a training officer? It's a very gut check gut check. And I'm originally from New Jersey, so it's a very filterless, uh, delivery. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm going to talk about those things and uh it's going to be kind of revamped and restructured so if you've took it before i appreciate that i promise it's better i'm not trying to recruit you to sit in it it's just this this one's going to be better i've learned a lot over the years to to gradually grow the program that uh it's i'm excited about this year's delivery of it so thanks frank bj will be teaching at fdic pj what class you got and any last words on mentoring Thanks, Frank. Yep, I have a workshop on uh, Monday more on Monday afternoon. Uh, fire dynamics in your fire ground, uh, straight up out of the uh, our book, um, Sean Gray's and mine book, which is available through Fire Dynamics Books and Videos. Uh, last few things I'd like to mention is FDIC. Yes, is only five weeks away, and I feel it extremely important because this would be the time when uh, when Chief Fulton would step in and make sure that he reminded us of all the other events and things going on at FDIC. So I think it's important now for everybody to start choosing your classes. I always recommend choose a, 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 a A class and a B class, because if you get to the door for class A, your choice, and it's sold out, it's filled up and the doors are closed, you don't want that panic mode of where do I go now? So have your A choice and your B choice for the class and start working on that now. And then don't forget to support the Stop, Drop, Rock and Roll, the Courage and Valor Run, uh, the 9-11 Memorial Stair Climb, and all the other many networking opportunities, which are great opportunities to mentor others, to be mentored by others, but also to support some uh, really great causes. So I really look forward to seeing everybody in a short five weeks in Indy. Thanks, PJ. Look forward to it. Chief Rubin, we're going to give you your uh, your plug and wrap up your thoughts on mentoring. And also, I've personally sat in on Chief Rubin's class. I've also read his books. Uh, beyond a consummate professional, your scope of experience and your willingness to share knowledge with anybody who calls you up. And uh, I hear you like to buy drinks, too. So that always puts you at a higher level. But uh, Chief Rubin, it was an honor to have you on the show today. Really my honor and and gosh, thank you for the kind, kind comments, but I learned more today than I than I gave. I assure you of that. I, I think both Chief McGlenn as well as Chief DeStefano, uh, tremendous, just excellent information. You two guys as facilitators, it's crazy good. Couldn't say no, even if it's at night while you guys are sitting outside drinking ice cold beer and I'm sitting home shivering. But uh, wow, what, what another great program. Uh, in terms of to winding up, I would just mention two quick things. One that we kind of stumbled upon in Atlanta, and I kept it going in Washington, is every month I would bring in different people and we would have a discussion about the rumors in the department. It would be videotaped. It would go out to all members of the department. Uh, what I tried to get them to do was to also send out Jiffy Pop along back when videotapes was the way we'd get it communicated. And then they would even do a section where you could ask questions. So some of the firefighters would say, hey, how come we're not doing back to basics, Rube? And of course, the really creative people I got to work with, that was in Washington. They actually came up with a t-shirt that said, I was on rumor control. So I would recommend that as a consideration. And I say that because when our union president shows up on the front ramp, calls everybody into the sitting room. I got to say that brings a ripple throughout the entire fire department, doesn't it, Frank? Absolutely. And everybody else wants to know what really happened. And by videotaping it, and maybe not in that structure, I get it when you're at the, at the dinner table, but we had a little studio in both places. People would come in and talk about EMS was a huge issue in Washington. Uh, everything in Atlanta was a huge issue and it really worked well. The second thing I would just mention about venting be careful. Be really, really careful. I would say when we talk about flow paths and ventilation, you have to be really precise and concerned and, and pay attention. If you can, I wouldn't vent at work. 
and I know I'm going against probably the most popular beliefs out there. I would go home and vent to my family. I would vent to people that that had more power than I did. I would vent to people who I, I would just be careful who I vented to. You just never know how, when, where, and why that's going to show up. And you meant it this way, and it was taken that way. And before you know it, it it's uh, becomes a bigger issue than you wanted or expected. I had a friend of mine that used a a, a slang about a fa- uh, about a process that was happening. How can I how can I describe that without using any crude words? But ultimately, he was held accountable that he had said something against a particular race. And then when he brought his wife in, that was of that race. It solved the problem pretty damn quickly. However. It was never meant that way. It was meant as a, a relief vent, and he said it and had to stand good for it. But it had absolutely nothing to do with anything about, uh, and and it, it it was just a, a ugly situation to help him walk through. So please, if you can, vent at home, vent at home. And you know what we used to say in Washington is, if you can, vent in a basement with no windows or doors. Think about that. <laughs> um, if you'll let me, I'll get a quick plug in for my presentation. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm going to go off on uh, Thursday, April 27th at 1.30. I don't know the classroom yet, but I'm hoping it's going to be a pretty good presentation. It's the Fulton County Courthouse Shooter Case Study. Uh, one day I was minding my own business engine. One zip passed. I followed him to the call. I can't help it. That's me. And uh, there was a gentleman out on uh, Martin Luther King Avenue that was shot one time. And before I knew it, he was a police sergeant, by the way, uh, actually a sheriff sergeant. He died on location and it just continued to spiral and spiral. Four more people would be, a total of four people would be shot. Several dozen were injured. I'm going to be joined by Dr. Uh, Jim Augustine, who is tremendous. Uh, Probably I'm going to call him at least America's Uh, medical director. He is now the formal medical director, the first one ever for the International Association of Fire Chiefs. And I want everybody to remember uh, the former position of our newest uh, editor-in-chief. He was a battalion in Atlanta, and he just said he might try to pop in. So please come by and see us. And I I think uh, PJ knocked it out of the park. I know there's going to be a great memorial for Chief Halton, I think, as well. And and the bands, they just they always melt my heart when the bands are all playing in that that you know couple of hundred people mass band. So thank you guys again and and our co-presenters, just incredible today. Thank you all. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Michael, my great co-host who keeps everything on track, PJ, and of course Peter Petrillo, who is behind the scenes making all this happen when he's not writing his manifesto in a cabin in New Jersey. And That's it for Politics and Tactics today. Uh, I'll be at FDIC. Please stop by the bookstore for the release of Command Presence. Increase your influence. I am teaching Wednesday, Aggressive Search. It's still about the victim. I make one promise to you. If you come to my class, you probably won't learn anything, but I'll entertain you. And that's it for Politics and Tactics. Everybody have a great day. Peter, take us off.